Hello, everybody. Come to hear about lenses. Um, this talk will not assume any prior experience or understanding of lenses. There will be no theory today. I will not delve into lens types, and most of the operators I won't touch either. Um, I work at BAE Systems. My name is John Wigley. We do research there, and we use Haskell for a lot of the projects we do. And in every single Haskell project we have there, we use lenses. And not because there's that one guy who thinks every project needs to have lenses in it, but because all of us on the team have found they're extremely useful. Um, so I kind of want to show you how we use lenses at work, not all the things lenses can do. Uh, you can learn a lot of that in, from other blog posts, but there's sort of a core set of killer apps for lens that it does better than almost any other approach. I want you to see that part of lens. So this is what I'm going to cover if I have the, all the time. So lenses and prisms, just to get some basics out of the way. Uh, traversals, when the power of lens starts really kicking in. Um, and then map and state, which those are the two killer ones. Those are the ones where once you combine lenses, prisms, maps, and state, you've already used lens to very, very good effect. Uh, a lot of the other things that it can do, which I'll cover if I have time, are totally optional. Um, there are some of those we don't even do, but just those four are what we mainly use it for, uh, where, where I am. Um, so a lens, as opposed to the other constructions, addresses some part of a structure <coughs> that always is there. So if you have some sort of product type, so it's a collection of multiple things, the thing in first position of that collection is always present. So the lens lets you look at that thing or reach or set that thing. Um, I have structure in quotes here because it doesn't necessarily have to be an in-memory structure like you're used to thinking of a real collection. It can be something computational. So if I have the time in seconds, for example, the hour is a part of that structure. There is a computational structure to time that you can turn that seconds value into hours, minutes, seconds, get the hour out, put in a different hour, go back to hours, minutes, and seconds, and lenses will let you basically see that hour inside the seconds value and it does all the conversion for you transparently behind the scenes. Um, so the very, very basic, most basic kind of a lens is the one that looks into tuples. Um, and, and it's fairly used fairly often, but it's also overloaded in that any product D thing has this accessor, these under bar one, under bar two. So you're gonna see them used in other contexts. The operator here is view. The most commonly used one is just this little caret dot. That says, given the product thing, this is the piece of that product I want. So in this case, I have a tuple of three, and I want to see the second element. That operator is also just called view as a function name, and I could be doing it this way that I have on the bottom too. Can you move the camera down a bit so I can see your face? Yeah. Do you see now? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, there are cases where you want to use the function version. For example, you can use a lens in a view pattern. So if you get an argument and you want a view pattern to pick out the, the second element of a product and pattern match on it, then you would just say view under bar two, arrow, and then give your pattern match. If I want to set an element inside of a product, so I have my same product of three, I use this ampersand, which is just flipped function application so that I can put the value on the left-hand side, under bar two, and then dot squiggly, and the value I want to substitute the second element for. That's called set, so I could do it as a function as well. So those two, view and set, are your bread and butter. Do you tend to use the syntax for functions? I use the syntax, yeah. You get very used to the syntax. Um, I'm all, I only use like 10 operators on average, so those are the 10 you're going to see in this talk, but view and set are the most used. Um, records are probably the least interesting way to use lens, but they're the ones that always get presented as here's what lenses can do. Uh, it gives you a more principled way or a or more convenient way to access and, and uh, set elements of records. And if you're using records in your program only shallowly, which means your records only ever contain relatively fundamental types, not records of records of records of records, using lens in your application is gonna feel like you're doing a lot of work for not much gain. Uh, and I've had applications where I tried to use lens everywhere just because lens, and then I was like, well, I could just be using record syntax for this. So records in a way are sort of distinguished products. They're just collections, but where every field has a, has a name. Um, and the way you set up a record to be used with lenses is you turn on template Haskell, you import lens, you have your record and you put an underbar in front of every, each field name, that's sort of a convention, and then you have this uh, compile time function make lenses, and that will just make all the lenses for your record, and they will, they will be named without the underbar. 
So field one will get you into that first field, field two will get you into the other field. Um, and here's view on a record. So now instead of the underbar one in, in the anonymous product, now I have a distinguished product, I'm getting the first field, uh, and I can do it with a set and have the same principal idea. <coughs> so the, the function <laughs> yeah, yeah, the binding is very low on ampersand. So record lenses become really useful when structure gets deep. And this example I'm going to give you is just record structure, like records referring to records referring to records. When you get to the day when you have a record with a map whose values are lists of other records, then you will find the true power of lens. <laughs> So here is a nested record accessor. This is record of record of record, where I'm reaching in to the bottom uh, record and I'm adding one to what's in that field. I could have also done it other ways. There's a whole set of mathematical operators that end with squiggle for doing different mathematical operations on the numerical thing that's there. I'm just gonna increment by one. Here it is in pure Haskell. <clears throat> because I don't know what the rest of the record contains, I have to preserve it. So I have to unwrap every record add one to the element that I care about, and then repackage it so that, I, so that I keep all the other stuff that was there. Whereas with lens, it's doing all that plumbing automatically for me. And lenses have this beautiful compositionality where once you start building up vocabularies of lenses to talk about your records, talk about your different data types, you can just start building arbitrarily complex chains. And in your mind, you can just think, how am I traversing through this? Not how am I unwrapping and rewrapping everything to preserve immutability. What kind of operator do you want? If you wanted to add, but you didn't have a plus. Oh. Yeah, I mean, yeah, some other function that you would have. I mean, it, Z is just a value here. You can apply whatever you want to it. No, going back to what is it? I'm saying, like, how would you write that? You just want to, you wanted to add one to the table. You didn't have a plus. Oh, you would write percent tilde to apply an arbitrary function. And, and I'll have percent tilde in a later example. We're going to get that. Yeah, that's coming up. So this is just lenses, which guarantee you that the, the element is always there. So lenses are kind of, they have, a, they have that hard requirement. Um, if you wanted to write lenses by hand, don't try to parse all that's in this slide. I kind of wrote these slides to also be future reference for you, because cargo culting is a good way to get started with lenses. There will be days when you want to write a lens that you can't figure out how to write it by composing other lenses. You can just write them as plain functions. Um, and the pattern is you get a function that is sort of an applicative arrow and your object that you want to modify. And you've got to descend into that structure, apply the applicative arrow, sequence out the applicative effects back to the top, and you're done. Um, if that doesn't make sense, that's okay. Most of the time, you won't have to write custom lenses. Here's the common operators that I use when using lenses. So the view and set we've already covered. If the thing you're setting to is a maybe value and you always find yourself wanting to just set to set it to say just 10, there's a special operator that just gives you the just there, the question mark field. Um, plus, there's plus tilde, minus tilde, star tilde, star star tilde. Every mathematical operator has its tilde variant. Uh, the monoid tilde is very, very handy uh, for, for adding things onto a, onto a list that's inside of a structure. Percent tilde applies an arbitrary function to the element, and percent percent tilde applies an arbitrary applicative effect, uh, effect having function. So, you, and then the, the applicative effect is gonna propagate out to the outside. Um, prisms. So prisms have a, have a relationship with lenses where if lenses are looking into the elements of products, prisms are looking at the possibilities of coproducts. So if I have a tuple and I wanna look at the first element, I look at a lens, if I have an either, and I want to look at the left value if it's there, then I'm using a prism. So prisms give you a way to look into things that may not exist. Um, and either is sort of the canonical, uh, canonical, canonical prism. To, you, to use your own prisms, you use them on your ADTs. So you write your ADT as you normally would, no special naming convention here, and you call this template function make prisms. Don't know the answer to that. I haven't used them. Um, the convention with prisms is they begin with an underbar when you use them. So this will, this will create prisms named underbar alpha, underbar beta, underbar gamma. 
And then because alpha is an, is an undistinguished product, it'll, it'll give you that as if it were a tuple there, that int and int. So we'll see that. We'll see how we can access the fields of the alpha constructor. So here's how I can view the element, uh, the second element of an alpha. You use a different operator. Instead of caret dot, you use caret question mark because it may not be there. If it is there, then you get just that value. And if it's not there, as I have in the second example, I have a gamma there, you just get back none. Um, what's cooler is when you try to set it. If I want to set the second field of an alpha to two, in the first example, it does just that. In the second, if I try to set a field and it's not that thing, it just ignores it. It's a no op. Um, this can be really nice if I want to write a generic algorithm that works over some structure that only works for a certain class of that structure if the structure has a particular shape. I can write it in terms of lenses and not care. And then the user who gives it to me, I'll do the right thing if it's the value I want. Otherwise, I'll just do nothing. Is there also a way to cause an error in that case? To cause an error on trying to set it if it's not that thing. I haven't done that. Yeah, show it to you. Well, it is a hackathon. You should try it. See what happens. <laughs> <laughs> I do know that, like, um, there's the IX and the app. Last yeah, time. we're getting to that. Okay. So the next, uh, oh, and so I wanted to show you the with and without lens. So this is the with lens of doing these, the incrementing of one inside of a prism. This is the without. So I have to case on the original data type, figure out that's the thing that I that my prism applies to. Then I have to repackage it with having broken down the record that represents the uh, the, the argument to beta and then applying it to the correct thing. So in this case, I'm mixing um, what would have been a lens and what is a, I mean, what, it, what would have been a prism and what would have been a lens. Um, and you can see that as the composition gets larger, this gets crazy. Uh, there, there are actual cases where I had a record that had maps that had records, and when I wrote the Haskell of it just to prove to my coworker that lenses were expressive, it was literally 20 lines of Haskell code doing nothing except what the one line of lens code was doing. But that's the power, um, the power to effort ratio. The effort you're putting into lens goes, you get more bang for your buck the more you're composing lenses. The more you're going deeply, the more you're dealing with computational structure. Um, you get crazy type errors. Because yeah. <laughs> all of this is being done with uh, type classes. So as you compose these things, you're basically you're basically aggregating a constraint where it takes on the most uh, specific constraint that's needed to express express the operation. So if you do it and apply the wrong operator, you're going to get oh I don't have this type of instance available. Um, and and those type errors, unfortunately, it's not always clear what it is that you did wrong. Um, but they will let you know that you did. <laughs> it's like a template uh, template error in C++. You know that you did something. Wrong. Um, this is how you would write a prism by hand. Uh, it's a little easier. You just say how to go from the, the right type up into the other type, and then how to break down that type to get to the part of the prism. Uh, so a traversal, like prisms that reference a thing that may or may not exist, traversals reference many things that may or may not exist. So for example, every element of a list. Um, traversals are very, very cool, very powerful. And in some cases where you think you're using a prism in, in lens, you might actually be using a traversal. There's a, a little bit of conceptual overlap there, but if we got into theory, that's where the differences would become clear. But in, as a user of lens, you, you may think of prisms as just a special case of traversals. Uh, so here is preview. Um, preview is the name of that tilde question mark operator. IX is a, tra a tra traversal. Here it looks like it's a prism, but it's a traversal that's looking at the one, the first element of the list with index zero, so that'll be the second element here. Um, and it's, it's telling me that that second element is just two because it exists. If it didn't exist, it would have given me nothing. And then the same with setting, works just like a prism. I say, I want to set the second element of the list. If it had been a shorter list, it would have just done nothing. If, why does it have to be a traversal? It seems like you'll always have like either just something or nothing, which fits into a prism, right? Because a traversal can reference a lot of things. I, oh, you mean why IX is? Yes. Um, if you if you see Shakov here, ask him that. He, he would know the answer to that. He's sort of like the Yoda of lens. Uh, and we're lucky that we have him here. Um, I don't know the exact answer. To that. Um, so I wrote a a traversal called digits, 
that just takes a number and turns it into a list of numbers representing every digit so that I could say, what is the, what is the third number from pi? Uh, it's just four because it's, uh, I have that much information here. And then I can set the third digit inside. So this is giving me another example of how traversal can be a computation as well and let me address everything inside of a structure that I map onto a notion of a list of some end, uh, of entities. And then they're also flexible. If I set the third digit to 99, it just makes the number bigger so that I can stuff that 99 in there. Kind of violation of the traversal model. It could be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that, I mean, there are, there are lenses in the world that are not entirely principled that are still handy. But yeah, no, I, you can write a version of this that will give you an error if you try to put something in there that's too big. The way that I'm doing this one is I'm literally just taking this number, uh, doing the show, cutting it up, doing read on all those, and then inverting that operation. Uh, but I think that that breaks, for example, if it, would, if it were the list of zero and zero, because it couldn't distinguish that from just regular zero. Yeah, and I tried to write that generally like the Python splice operator. So I, and I got it to work, but it didn't fulfill the laws. So very likely this one doesn't fulfill it. Um, so monoids. Monoids uh, are related to traversals in that if I view a traversal, so I have a traversal that say looks at a whole bunch of elements in a structure, and I just still did the arrow dot, uh, the, the, the caret dot. The reason why I mention this is because you're going to do it, and you're going to get an error about how something isn't a monoid. And you're going to wonder what the heck do monoids have to do with anything. What the traversal will do is if you view a traversal, it views the monoid combination of everything the traversal points at. And that's sort of like the default behavior. Caret dot dot is usually what you want if you want to view an entire traversal. What caret dot dot does is it turns every element that you look at into a singleton list so that the monoid can group them all together into a list. So here's an example uh, using the monoid. So traverse says address every element in the collection. And then I'm just going to say two, which is the sort of trivial getter that lists any function into, uh, into a getter. It's going to take every element of this list and it's going to pass it to sum to create sum of that element. And then because I'm using caret dot, it's just going to manually append all the results and give me the sum. And then below you see caret dot dot just lets me use traverse to get this into a list. Now this isn't very interesting. I've used, I've gone from a list to a list, but it does get more interesting when you're traversing more complex things. Um, a fold is like a traversal, except it's kind of, uh, it's read only. You can't push back into it. There are tons of folds. So here, all of is a fold that takes a, that takes a traversal and then applies a function to every element of that traversal and sees whether they're all true. So it's a bool returning function. So what I'm saying here is, look at every tuple in this list and look at its second element. Are they all even? Um, of course, you could write this using regular old Haskell functions and composition, you could. Where this becomes more useful is when you start working with lenses and you have a lens. And you're like, oh, I have this lens, I don't want to figure out how to translate that into the regular Haskell version. Now I can apply this fold with it. Is that the same traverse? Yeah, it's the same traverse. Yeah, that's part of the magic of the theory of how these lenses work. Not covering. <laughs> yeah, watch Ed Command if you want your mind blown for how the traverse works here. Um, you could do it that way too. You could you could traverse and say um, to all, and then look at the mono. Uh, and whether it's implemented this way or not, I don't know. There are lots of folds, so. You have a lot of options for things you can do with your traversals besides just look at them with you. Uh, and, and there's still more of them. So in terms of it, probably the largest collection of things I found in the lens library is folds. There's a very large collection like this of traversals too. Uh, it's just a very, very big vocabulary for doing a lot of the things you're used to doing in normal Haskell, but now you can use your lenses in, in, in conjunction with those operations. So here's a little review of the vocabulary, because if you look at the haddock, uh, the haddock for lens, you're going to see a lot of words in the type signatures. Um, we saw a lens already. That's a thing that I can read and write to that addresses a single element. There's also a getter, which is read only for a single element. So it's got fewer restrictions on it. More things can be getters than can be lenses. So we can use two to lift 
any function into a getter. You have ISOs, which is like a lens, except the thing that you're lensing to can be let, can go back to the thing that you lens that you look at it from. So it means that it's an alternate representation for the same thing. Um, Sorry, um, what's the intuition for the name ISO? Uh, it's an isomorphism. Okay. Yeah. So you've got um, so the, the example here, lazy. You've got a strict version of a byte string and a lazy version of a, of a byte string. There is a ISO called lazy that you can in your lens composition you just say blah 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 dot lazy dot blah 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 and now you've turned a strict byte string in the midst of your traversal into a lazy byte string. Um, then you see the prism. Maybe you can read from it. Maybe you can write from it. Maybe it, it accesses zero or one elements. Um, fold setters and traversals are working on multiple elements, so zero or more. Um, and these are common operators to be using with traversals. So caret dot dot is very very common. Caret question mark probably the most common. Uh, caret question mark bang says I know it's there. Give me an error if it's not. Uh, and there are times when it's convenient when you can reason about your code and know that it's going to exist. Um, so maps. Maps is kind of where I get on the train with Lens. So maps are what really pushed me into Lens because the things you can do with maps means you don't have to remember all the functions that deal with maps. So at is your, um, is your accessor for looking at the element of a lens where it returns a maybe. Um, so you say caret dot at one. If it's there, you get a just. If it's not, you get a nothing. It's a little different from IX. IX being the traversal that will let you look at things that are in a map. We're going to look at in a moment. The nice thing about at is that when I want to assign to it, um, if I assign to that position as just X, it will add it to the map. If I ass is there a difference between the two? Oh yeah, I did get, I forgot to, I forgot to. Um, this was at if it was present, at if it was absent, right? But then, oh yeah, <laughs> got it wrong. Yeah, I wrote tests for all of these, but then the, the slide deck references the test by name. I have the test name wrong there. Yeah, that should be nothing. That should be doing at three and having nothing. So you so use a lens on this presentation in which everything is correct. <laughs> um, non is a nice thing to use with at. Uh, one of the reasons why you would use at instead of ix to get at an element. At says uh, non with at says if it's there, give what the at would have found. If it's not there, give the argument you passed to non. So here I'm saying at two non z. Well, two is the, the value for two is there, so return it. Otherwise, if I'm looking at three non z, I'll, I'll, I will return z. So non gives you a way to have a default. Right? Is non a prism or a lens? So, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no theory today. Okay. <laughs> um, that makes it easy to get out of certain questions. <laughs> so here's the IX version of doing things. So uh, caret question mark, IX1, it, it is there. IX3, it's not there. Um, here's me demanding it with uh, IX, probably not a safe thing to do. And then setting with IX, this is different than setting with at. So if I say at one dot till just Z, it will create it if it's not there, meaning the, the set will always work. And if I set with nothing, it will always delete the element or do nothing if it wasn't there already. IX, however, works as a traversal where I'm setting that element. If that key is there, it will set the value of that key. If that key is not there, it does nothing. So, so that's a difference between at and IX. So I end up using both uh, in my work with maps. And then just as we had non to go with at, we have failing to go with IX. Failing says, try the first traversal. If that doesn't do anything, try the next traversal. Oh, that's just a way for me to construct maps. Uh, that's data.map.from list, but it was getting long. Um, so state, state is the other cool thing. And when you've got state and maps and records all together, then you'll thank me. Um, so just as you have get with regular um, state and monad state, you have use to apply a lens to the thing in your state. So I have a product in my state, 10 comma 20, I use under bar one, that will return test, uh, you know, if I have to use my little binding arrow. Um, uses, takes a lens and a function, gets you the thing via the lens, applies the functions to it, the function to it on the way out, just like that. Pre-use is if you're working with a prism or traversal, and pre-uses, like uses, lets you pass a function along with it. Set is dot equals. And this is kind of cool because now you can modify subsections of your state 
writing code that begins to look a lot like C. You can say, I, so, my, so in my state is a list of four elements. I say ix1 dot equals five. I'm saying, if the list is long enough, change its second element to be five. Otherwise, don't do anything. It's not an error. Um, I can even use monadic functions. And this becomes much more useful in state T. The monadic function, and I have a version of bind with a squiggly instead of a straight line, goes into what the target, what the traversal points at. Uh, and that would work with the legs too. Just parse those. Is it ix.5? Is that a monad state? Um, ix1 dot equals 5 is a monadic action that's over monad state okay. of some state con containing a list of four elements. Right. Yeah. Uh, I was trying to find the most representative way to write this that would still work as part of the test suite. So sorry if this is a little unclear, but yeah, these are monadic actions on the left of exact state. And the state I'm running the action under is on the right of the So the ix1 squiggly arrow is just a monadic setting. Uh, the target of that lens, or traversal. Um, over percent equals lets me apply a function to the thing in my state, so it's like modify, except it's modifiable potentially a sub-element. Um, ID, the function ID, is a is an ISO, <laughs> because everything is a small group itself. So if you had a state that was just a number, and you wanted to apply a function to it, you could also write ID percent equals function, and it would apply that function to the current state. Now zoom. Zoom is, a, zoom is a little more powerful than it even looks at, looks at first because it, it lets you write your, your stateful functions in a different way. So zoom takes a lens and it says, the, and, and another stateful monadic action, and says this monadic action you're passing to zoom, I'm going to execute it with its state being the substate referenced by the lens. So my state here is a product whose first element is another product, and I'm saying dive into the first product and run a stateful action on that, where under bar two there is referring to the two in my original state. And then the result of that becomes one comma four as a product, comma three. So Zoom is letting me look into parts of my state. Is that always equivalent to just composing the two lenses and then like using SAT or something? Um, if, yeah, but if you say you had multiple actions that you had zoomed in, you'd have to be repeating that composition everywhere. <laughs> um, where Zoom kind of really comes into its own is where you have an application, you want to be really principled, so you want to do everything with stateful functions instead of using IO and IO or S or whatever. But you never know when you're going to want certain pieces of state in different places. So you end up making everything be in the same state product. And then you have functions that will only ever reference a part of that state and other functions that reference a different part. Well, Zoom allows you to program differently. Each function can specifically address only the kind of state it is interested in. And you can keep lifting those building blocks into larger composed state actions using Zoom. So now you have a program where every little piece only does what that piece is interested in, what that piece knows about. You don't have to have some part of the state that that function never needs to care about. Just make it focus on, in this case, like just the first product. And now I can lift that second monadic action into a state where it's product comma number. I could also lift it into a state where under bar two meant something else. I could lift it into a state that was a tuple of three. I could lift it into a state that was a tuple of four. So Zoom is allowing my, my more directed functions to become usable in more contexts. I think you'd lose your question. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, another case where, Len where state kind of, kind of comes in um, useful is you will, you will find yourself, especially when dealing with records, doing multiple sets in a row. And what's nice about using the ampersand version of this is that you can just stack them. So that it kind of begins to look a little bit like record setting, where you have field after field after field. But there's another way to do it. You can say ampersand tilde. And it says the thing on the right is a monadic action whose state is the thing on the left. And so now I can use my dot equals operator to assign to all the members of that record. This would, this would be the typical way to write it, but you can write it like this too. And now you can use the other magic of state like zoom and other things as well.
So things we did not cover today, um, and these are also mostly things that I don't use either. There's a lot of cool stuff in Lens. Um, just like there's all these cool things for dealing with state, there's, there are also cool things for dealing with uh, writer. And there's a, there's a kind of a Zoom equivalent for writer too. Um, lens action lets you deal with lenses that have a monadic result, although that's not all that much used. Lens ISON, however, is very much used at my company. That lets you take arbitrary uh, values, JSON values, and just dive into them with all kinds of accessors for looking at the different parts of the JSON value. Um, that right there, Lens ISON, makes it very easy to sell uh, lens inside my company to people who haven't worked on our projects before. Uh, it begins to look like XPath, really, for, for dealing with anything. Uh, time, T-H-Y-M-E, is a cute library that lets you work with time values, as it had a whole bunch of lenses for looking at the hour, the minutes, and seconds. There's a whole family of lenses called indexed lenses that, that make available to you the index of the thing that they're traversing on um, that we haven't covered. There's zippers, which let you kind of dive into a structure, get to, get to the position you want a lens to, but then walk around from there. Oh, I want to go down to this deep sub-object, but now I want to go to the second sub-object right next to it and sort of iteratively crawl over there instead of constantly going down to the next object and the next object and the next object. Um, there's exception lens, except, exception lenses, stuff for dealing with arrays and vectors, things for dealing with file paths, and also a whole bunch of uh, functions for dealing with different numeric stuff, like converting to different radices, going from hex to octal, uh, doing different math operations, that kind of thing. Um, the last sort of thing I want to show you here is a very, very cool thing that will blow your mind. Um, and if you want to keep your mind, just stay away from these slides, just part of the thing. <laughs> Parts of. So I said a traversal lets you look at multiple elements in a lens. Now a traversal, we, we've kind of been boring here and been looking at lenses. I could have a traversal, for example, over all the values in a map. Parts of takes a traversal and presents it as a list. Lets you modify that list, the structure of that list, and then puts it back. Okay? So this is what's happening in this example. I have a list. I'm going to traverse, and I'm using traverse with this D at the end. That allows me to refer to the indices of the traverse. I could have used traverse without the D, but then I couldn't use this word indices on the right thing. Traversed looks at every element of the list, but I only care about the ones whose indices are odd. Positions 1, 3, 5, etc. I want to reverse those elements. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, it does what it says, right? It's very actually easy to read once you can unpack it. So what would have happened if you had changed the number of items in that list? <laughs> there, are kind, there are caveats to parts of. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, another thing you can do with parts of is you could have, I could have assigned another list to take all the odd positions. If there were not enough, it would have only gone up to as many as I had had and would have left the other ones unchanged. If there were too many, it would have just ignored all the extras I gave. So parts of has some little restrictions that are, can be procrastinated, but it won't give you an error in this case. So here's another little example. Uh, this time I get to use traverse only because I don't need to reference the indices. I want to look at every element in this list that is less than four. I want to, I want to sort that and then reverse the sorted list. Just imagine trying to write this with plain Haskell. <laughs> Whereas Lens lets me state it in a declarative way exactly what I mean. All the parts of this list that are less than four, I want to sort them in place and reverse them in place. This, this slide deck is on GitHub. It is there for you. Along with a lot more examples than these two in a file called lenses.hs, which is actually what I use to cargo code my own password. I often forget how to use some of these things. Like, I know that. What's your GitHub? Uh, Jay Wigley, github.com, Jay Wigley. And it should be the first uh, repo in the list because it's what I was working on. Um, here's a parts of with each. So, each, say I have a gigantic tuple. Each lets me is a traversal over every element of the tuple. So now with parts of, I can look at that list, of, I can look at that tuple as if it were a list. And I can sort the elements in that tuple. Try that with Haskell. This one, I know the function you have to write, but you wouldn't want to do it. 
um, setting, like I said to him. Here I'm going to do a traversal over all the alphabetic characters in the string, and I am going to overwrite as many of those characters as I have in my replacement string. So it takes the hello world, and it writes howdy over all the alphabetic characters. <laughs> <laughs> and then last example here I have, um, so I take, the, I take this, this uh, empty sort of a template for, for a time value, and I want to write over the minutes and seconds part. So I'm going to say everything that is past position three, uh, at or past position three, that is equal to a zero, put these numbers over top. So the lens here is giving me a way to identify the part of the template that I want to become a utility. And then I can just decide here. Now, because you've all been good and we have time, um, there's one more. This is even worse. This is worse than parts of. <laughs> I have not yet used this in practice, but um, uh, you, you can't not know about biplate. And you don't want to know how biplate's implemented either. <laughs> biplate is a traversal that can walk through arbitrary structures and identify things of a specific type. <laughs> so this traversal says, go through this structure, and I have this, this ugly here, mix this, this uh, nested tuple here with um, elements of different value types, uh, elements of different types. Make a list of all the strings that are in that collection. Yes? Does it require a what constraint? Yes. Yeah, but now you get typable on everything. Post GHC 7, 8, and 7, 10. Um, yeah. And then this is this is me getting out every integer. All right, these are these are pain. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because we can mix by plate and parts of. <laughs> <laughs> but before we do that. I'm going to take this collection, the same collection, all the examples use the same collection. I want a two upper every character that's in it. That's the intuition of the Uniplate. So there's a, there's a library called Uniplate. Research that. You'll understand that. <laughs> um, so here it is with parts of. So I'm going to buy plate to get all the, to look at all the strings in the collection. I'm going to use parts of to let me think of those strings as a list. And I'm going to reverse that list. So I'm basically going to, so, so my by plate is going to take all the things. <laughs> yeah. The laughing lets me know you get what this is. Yeah. yeah. How? How could you write that in regular hospital? Why would you not? Why would you not? <laughs> and why would I want you to want to write it with lens, right? This is the thing that. I, I don't know if it was Ed or Shakov showed me this in the Haskell Lens channel, and I was just like, what? <laughs> so this is more for prosperity than your own personal use. Um, and then this one says, I want to buy plate over all uh, characters less than the character M. Use parts of to sort those. <laughs> so anything above M in the alphabetic lexical ordering is going to stay in place. Anything below M is going to get reversed in position. <laughs> but see, it stays, it stays recognized. I mean, you understand what this is doing, right? You, did, you would not understand what the Haskell version of this was doing. Um, and then this is the last one. What? Yeah, all these slides are actually tests that have to run before the PDF is made. <laughs> If you stare at it long enough, it'll stare back at you. <laughs> <laughs> so this last one says, look at everything in here from which I can traverse a string. I want to look at the head of that thing and uppercase it. So I get to capitalize all strings that are in the structure. Now, you have to use type signatures when you're using biplate a lot, because if you don't, it has no idea which kind of element you want to address. So the types here are actually part of the signature of this lens in a sense, because the type 
is what is giving BiPlate the information on what to uh, work upon. So here, the type has to be even more general uh, over anything that supports data, just because of the operation and so forth. So that's the end of the slides. Um, with the exception of this latter half, which was there just for your amusement, um, I hope I motivated what makes lenses nice and useful, and that even though people may tell you there's a zillion operators, there's terrible types, there's horrible theory, you don't actually have to know that to make productive uh, use of lens. You will have to know to understand the errors sometimes, but you will kind of get a flavor for what the errors are and go to the Haskell Lens channel if you run into problems. There are true experts there who will know the answers to your questions. Thank you for pointing out that you can apply lenses in a library Right, lenses are just functions, which I wasn't going to get into, but I will for now. Since lenses are just functions, you can put them in your library with zero dependency on lens and they will just work. Because all these fancy lens types, when you look under the hood, they're just functions with constraints like applicative, functor, traversable, etc. So if you know how they translate, you can write lenses without lens. <laughs> Yeah, let me restate what his comment is because there was a time that I actually would have wanted biplate before we got in too heavy into lens. If you've ever used SVB, uh, it's not SVB, SIB, SYB, scrap your boilerplate. So if you write a compiler, you've got gigantic ASTs. And a lot of times there will be common little bits that are all throughout your AST, but in different positions. And you don't really care about the structure of the thing you just parsed. You just want to say, sweep through my AST and do a variable substitution. Or sweep through my AST and do this operation on all fields for every constructor that have this type in common. So in, in the old days, you would use scrap your boilerplate to very easily write a function like that, a generic traversal function that targets all your things of type X within a structure. Biplate is that within the lens world. So I can have an AST and I can annotate that AST or, or write some thing that does a substitution on particular parts of my AST, identifying what I want to mutate by type rather than its position in the AST. And uh, that, that's actually a case where I would there's a slide you skipped. Uh, I'm not sure if it was between biplate or between biplate and parts of or right. This? Yeah, yeah, that one. Oh, yes. I mentioned this earlier. I had just put this in here to yeah, show you what it looks like. Yeah. Uh, because lenses are ordinary functions, and, and this is sort of one of the key intuitions of lens if you get if you get somewhat into the theory of it. Because they are just functions, that composition operator between lenses is just the regular function composition operator, and you can use them in all kinds of places because you can use functions almost everywhere in Haskell. So uh, pattern guards, view patterns, um, view inside your pattern synonyms, anywhere you could have applied a function to do something, you can use view or set or all of or all these various different things with, with lenses. Here's the I don't. But ask Chaka. <laughs> How's the performance? A biplate? Of lenses in general. Are there functions. <laughs> you can write badly performing lenses if you really want to, but most of them are pretty darn quick. They get all the same optimizations that regular Haskell functions do. Yeah. Biplate, you might be paying an overhead cost, but you do with scrap your boiler plate too. Yeah, nearly everything in the lens library is marked inline or inlineable. So almost all of this syntax that you're seeing here just gets boiled off. I haven't really noticed too much for it when switching to a lens usage. I mean, it depends on what you're doing with them, maybe, but. Yeah, it's not very um, if you are interested in the theory, I highly recommend the 
talk given by Simon Peyton Jones on Skills Matter. He has a presentation of lenses there, which is what allowed me to get it. Uh, I think it's very clear and extremely well presented. Um, how does the surface look up? Want to modify something and not get a question? That I can't tell you. That I don't know at all. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, aren't there various kinds of lenses that can be <laughs> Yes. <laughs> theory questions for Bowden. <laughs> <laughs> This is von Larhoven lenses, not profunctor lenses, not tuple of Getter and Setter lenses. This is the lens package on package. There's also a dependency version. Yeah, there's micro lens, pico lens, lens family core. Uh, there's a lot of different alternate <laughs> representation of this concept. Uh, lens has dropped some of its huge dependencies it had in the past. It broke out lens action, it broke out lens ison, it took away. Um, a dependency on uh, a thing on, on split on the split library so it, it's it has slimmed down a little bit but if you're writing a library intended for consumption by the whole Haskell world learn the theory and write your lenses as functions if you're writing an application who cares just put in lenses your dependency be happy that's what we do sorry didn't you just say that lens compiled down to just functions so wouldn't it not have, like, even if you used in your library, it's not, not as a lens Well, it needs to see the lens library at compile time to be able to have access to the definitions that can be in Sorry. Yeah. Right. So, lens library for application, lens is this function for the library. It's the Do you know if there's anything like this uh, combinator from Yeah, there is one. Okay. Oh, reader. I see. Um, <laughs> 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 They're on. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. I don't want to. Uh,